uh, record this session. Well, we're, we're already recording this session, um, and uh, we'll also share the slides with you. And uh, we have uh, two excellent speakers today. Uh, uh, Ellie Papadopoulou from the Open Air talking about uh, data privacy, and we also have. Uh, Abdurrahman Azab from US Carbon University of Oslo, who will walk us through sensitive data services. Uh, and we'll also start with uh, brief uh, presentations uh, about uh, two projects uh, co organizing uh, this webinar US Carb and uh, Open Air. And um, I invite Isabel Campos to start with short use cup presentation. And by the way, if you have any questions, please type them uh, in the chat. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, present in the next four or five minutes the project EOS Hub, as you see in the first slide, is, uh, is, is an overwhelming coordinating uh, effort with around 100 partners, uh, which will uh, run until December 2020 with the aim of uh, integrating and managing uh, services in the hub. Uh, next slide. OK, I'll move here. Uh, this is more or less the, the layout of the project. Uh, it it is, we are mobilizing providers from the EGI Federation, the European Grid uh, Initiative, from the EUDAT uh, storage platform, and from the Indigo Data Cloud Service Provider, who offer advanced data-driven research and innovation services. This includes uh, uh, data privacy uh, and uh, security-oriented uh, uh, services for data. Okay? Uh, these resources are offered via the hub, yeah? uh, which I will describe now. Uh, the high-level goals of, of the project are uh, simplifying the access um, to resources and services um, by providing an open and integrated service catalog, uh, reduce the fragmentation of service access and provisioning. Uh, and the way to do this is implementing things through interoperability uh, and standards and uh, you know, good practices in, uh, in, in service implementation and development. Uh, a more long-term uh, aim is consolidating research infrastructures by improving service quality uh, with the final uh, end of widening the access to services to all user groups. Uh, so as you see, it's a very, very ambitious uh, project in terms of objectives. Um, for that, the project has created the EOS Hub, yeah, which is a federated integration and management system in which you can find services. Uh, you can find federate, federation services, which are meant to have the whole system operating. So these are not services let's say, oriented to the users, but to the infrastructure managers. Yeah. Uh, then you have uh, services like data application tools, services, uh, training, consultancy, etc., which are more oriented to end users. And uh, we also have uh, quite some activity in processes and policy implementation of our guidelines, uh, etc. So what can you do with, with EOS Hub? Uh, many things, of course. Uh, uh, to begin with, you can do high throughput computing with your data. Yeah, you can run computational jobs at large scale on the EGI infrastructure, much in the same way than, than the LHC experiments do. This we know. We know how to do for many years. So if, if you think you need a service for distributed computing, for distributed analysis of data, uh, just ring the bell. Yeah? Uh, we have uh, centers like uh, CSC and the University of Oslo as uh, this has uh, this will be a portrait later by you know a presentation that are also providing tools and services related with data privacy. Yeah. So what else? Uh, we have uh, federated computing and infrastructure as a service and platform as a service uh, services uh, to support cloud computing and data intensive uh, workloads. Okay. So I put the links there in the presentation so that you can check when, when we are done or you have questions. Uh, and there we can host also long-running services like web services, databases, etc. And we have uh, infrastructure disposable for testing and development. 
So there we have uh, okay, very nice features like single sign-on Docker containers uh, and uh, a service of technical support during the project lifetime. Okay, and very fancy things. Yeah, we have very fancy things like uh, Jupyter notebooks that are so much in fashion too, and which perhaps is a nice way to go to towards the famous uh, intelligent publications, intelligent articles. No. Um, okay, so this basically consumes my time. Um, I put here the web page of the of the project, eos-hub.eu. As I said, I have um, added there some links that are the marketplace that is now brought into the EOS portal and will evolve from there. And I hope you, you find something interesting there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Isabel. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat. Uh, and uh, I will briefly talk about uh, OpenAir project, uh, which supports open science scholarly communication and also offers uh, monitoring services uh, on open science. And uh, we do this by building a scholarly communication graph. We harvest metadata from uh, uh, open access repositories with publications, uh, from data repositories, from uh, research information systems, from uh, any other providers of uh, scholarly content. And uh, we did applicate uh, this uh, harvested metadata, and we provide links between uh, publications, data sets, funding information, uh, um, and other interlinked uh, scientific products and outputs. And uh, based on that, we offer different services. Uh, so for example, uh, we have uh, part of our portal, which is called Explore. And that's a place where you can find uh, uh, publications, data sets, uh, most of which are available in open access. Uh, uh, we also offer Zenodo, which is a shared repository where um, any researcher could deposit uh, any research outputs. Uh, we also provide uh, monitoring services for funders. Uh, we uh, provide research analytics services. Uh, uh, we have information about open science developments uh, in different countries. Uh, and uh, we help funders and institutions monitor uptake of open access uh, um, and also any other open science related developments. Uh, we also have services for content providers, uh, repositories, uh, open access journals, uh, data archives. Uh, we enrich uh, the usage analytics. Uh, we also enrich uh, metadata with additional information that we collect. Uh, and uh, uh, we also have services for researchers, such as Help Desk, where you can ask any questions about open science. We organize training events like this one. And I already mentioned Zenodo, which is a repository for publications. Uh, we also have uh, a new portal, which is a virtual uh, research, research environment for research communities where different research communities could store and share their research outputs. Uh, and um, we uh, have uh, a data anonymization tool uh, called Amnesia. And uh, we are launching uh, a machine-readable uh, data management planning service uh, and uh, everything we do is available as open um, APIs. Uh, and uh, one more slide with a list of uh, specific services for researchers. Zenodo repository, Amnesia tool to anonymize your data sets, uh, more information about open science uh, training and support. And uh, one of our products is also School Explorer which uh, helps to interlink data and literature. Uh, so that's uh, 
that was a quick introduction. And now I hand over to Ellie for the main part of the webinar. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ellie Budupulu. I'm a librarian and I work for a FINA Research Center in Greece. And my affiliation, my role in OpenA is to uh, I act as the National Open Access Desk for Greece. And for this webinar, uh, I have prepared a brief introduction to data processing, uh, which is part of data management uh, lifecycle, uh, focusing on data privacy and sensitive data, uh, so that uh, it ties with the services that EOSC have will present later. Uh, for data processing, we'll see uh, what is data processing, uh, what, uh, where is it positioned in data management lifecycle, what are its components, and then moving on to data privacy, and what are the elements, and how to handle sensitive data. So data processing is the operational phase during which raw data is being manipulated to result from meaningful information. So it's basically all the processes taking place immediately after collection or creation of data until the deposit of data. What are these data? These are textual uh, files, images, audio, and of course their metadata. And they're, they're, they can be electronic, uh, digital, analog, and physical in format. So files and all, all, the, all the materials. And here I have some basic, uh, I've, I've added some basic examples where you can see a table from, uh, with information from a survey uh, that, uh, that were imported in the spreadsheet. These are the raw data and then down after the analysis of this data, you can see visualization of uh, this information. And then on the right hand, you can see some, uh, some unedited photos and then edited and filtered um, after, um, after processing. So data management uh, life cycle is, uh, ha has many stages, but data processing takes place between data collection and data preservation. And it has to do mainly with the handling and the curation of data. And it's something that having uh, this uh, have, we have to have in mind uh, when writing the data management plan. Um, and these processes uh, involve ingestion or aggregation, analysis, classification of data, metadata enrichment, organization of data, validation, and storing. So basically, things that have to do, uh, things that uh, what we do when researchers do with data, where they combine multiple pieces of data, where they to ensure that this uh, this applied data is correct and relevant, or to to make uh, to, to deposit the data, to prepare the data for deposit uh, in a proper format and supported by the repository or the secure place that they will be depositing it, and also all these um, processes apply here. There might uh, there might be reprocessing of data for uh, data migration to new for formats and softwares, so that they are so that long term uh, preservation of data is ensured. And also, data processing involves data disposal as well. Um, some things that have to do with data processing. Uh, with data processing in a data management plan and in a fair manner as um, as, uh, as are the specifications uh, and the requirements coming from the European Commission. And we have to make sure that the type of data uh, are deposited uh, in a format that it's supported um, uh, by the repository that the metadata are, are created with standards using some protocols and standards and that persistent identifiers um, are applied to the data sets. Uh, these are all part of processing of data and uh, has the, ro the role to play in the fair compliance of the data sets. 
Uh, for that, uh, this information can be also found in data management policies or repository policies um, of organizations and uh, projects. And they contain uh, retention information, uh, information for how to withdraw or when to withdraw uh, data, uh, what, the type, what the exact format uh, of the data should be, what are the metadata standards that are um, supported by um, by the information systems, uh, where to store the data and how to back it up, and all this information regarding data processes and, and what its organizations processed are um, highlighting in those policies, the organizational policies. So for data privacy and sensitive data, zooming in, um, there are currently in the EU two major um, two major laws and directives. So one uh, is the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, which has to do mainly with uh, personal data, but also with sensitive data as well, so that the user has better control of the data uh, acquired by commercial providers. And then uh, we have the intellectual property rights and all the directives from copyright to trade secrets and unitary patent systems. Uh, the sensitive data uh, can be can have multiple types. So personal data can be sensitive data as well as metadata. We, we shouldn't forget the metadata uh, always. Uh, confidential data are uh, sensitive data are considered sensitive data because uh, there are trademarks and investigations data involved. Security data as passwords, financial information, national safety, and military data as well. Uh, sensitive data are also data protected by intellectual property rights. Um, they can also be location data, geo data, and mobile phone data, data coming from our mo mobile phones. Uh, also from uh, endangered species um, and all this data coming from bi the biodiversity community. And also a combination of different data sets could lead to sensitive data. And this is why anonymization is crucial when uh, we handle sensitive data. Uh, uh, more specifically, uh, for sensitive data and all these categories, um, racial or ethnic origin data, political opinions apply here, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic and biometric data, physical or mental health, sex, life, or sexual orientation, and criminal offenses. But what are the best practices of uh, ensuring, of securing your data and handling the sensitive data? Uh, I've uh, only listed three, uh, six, sorry, six here. It's, uh, you can secure your data by applying uh, access controls, uh, by having passwords uh, for the data sets and uh, having a firewall to avoid uh, malicious attacks by hacking or some uh, computer viruses. Uh, you can anonymize your data by removing or aggregating variables or reducing the precision or detailed textual meaning of a variable so that even when the when two anonymized data sets uh, are combined, you cannot be able to identify the, the subject or the specific uh, sensitive uh, data. Uh, you can encrypt uh, data using encoded digital information. You can uh, even you have the control and you give the key for uh, decoding or decryption, sorry, <laughs> or decryption to specific subjects and uh, users that you know. Uh, you can share your data in a secure place. Of course, this uh, doesn't involve cloud drives like Google Drive or OneDrive, since these are uh, from commercial providers and they're connected to internet, so it's not that safe. Um, it's not that it's a bad practice of sharing data. Uh, store in an store data in an isolated machine. Uh, preferably where the server is not connected to internet, 
so that uh, we avoid uh, all malicious attacks. And secure disposal is also uh, a key uh, when a key issue when we want to delete when we want to delete the data. So this means that we have to make sure that no data recovery is possible. So by by deleting only, um, we don't secure this. We have to make sure that we uninstall uh, some tools or softwares uh, or um, proper delete from the root. The, the source that we've been working on. These are some useful resources where you can draw information about data security, data privacy, and sensitive data. I've also included the amnesia analyzation tool provided by Opener here, as Irina did as well. But uh, just so you know, uh, Opener has a task force at the moment working um, in pr producing some guidelines for sensitive data with an emphasis on long-term preservation. So this is forthcoming, and we will be letting you know when it will be available. Um, questions, I think, at the end. But thank you very much for your attention. And now. Thanks a lot, Elia. Wait just a minute. And now Abdurrahman will talk about uh, sensitive data activities in ESCOB. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Abdurrahman Azab. I work at the University of Oslo uh, in Services for Sensitive Data at the University of Oslo. And I'm co-leading task 6.6 .6 in ASIC Hub, that is the sensitive data activities. Uh, the sensitive data services in ESIC Hub includes two services. One is services for sensitive data at the University of Oslo, where I'm working. And the other one is the sensitive data cloud. And this is at CSC in Finland. And I'm going to present both of them briefly. Uh, first, I will present the ePOTA Secure Cloud, that is the sensitive data cloud at CSC in Finland. Uh, there is uh, a video about it. I will share with you the link in the chat here. And let's go through the description. So uh, CSC. Uh, uh, POTA is cloud in, in, in Finnish, and they have two uh, cloud services. One is CPOTA and one is ePOTA. CPOTA is for non-sensitive data, and ePOTA is for sensitive data. Both of them are based on OpenStack, and they are infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service, it means that they provide to you the uh, the CPU quota, the memory and disk, and you generate your own virtual machines and you manage them. Means that those who are going to use uh, ePOTA, which is the sensitive data service at CSC, you need to have your own engineer, your own software managers who are going to install the operating system and uh, they are going to install the software on the top of that. Uh, this is the disadvantage that you need to manage your own things. The advantage of that it is flexible. You can install your own queuing systems, your own software. There is no limitation. What it will provide to you is that it will provide a collection of virtual machines that is located in a CSC that will be part of your network. And I will describe how this is happening. So this is your site. Uh, assume that you are a hospital, for example, and you have a machine here that you want to administrate the resources in the cloud. And you will connect to CSC in Finland through the internet. This will be encrypted, secure connection. And this will be your end users, researchers. And then there will be virtual machines on the other side <coughs> if you are going to use uh, ePOTA for storage, for high-performance computing, for both. 
So those will be your resources. The IP addresses will be included in your network IP addresses. It means that you will not feel that this virtual machines, these virtual machines are somewhere else. They will look like that they are part of your local hospital network. So your researchers will access them like the same way they access any local machine in the hospital. But, but as I said, this will be infrastructure as a service, so it is your responsibility to install things there. And this is more on the technical side. So there will be uh, MPLS connection. This is a secure connection. Your switch here, and there is another switch on the other side. And there is the admin mode, and there is the user mode. The admin mode is through a web interface that will access CSC through a firewall, where you can generate new virtual machines. You can give access to new users. And then the user interface, where you are going to access those, those uh, virtual machines through the hospital network. And for the design choices, there is no internet connectivity from the virtual machines. You will not be able to open browser on the virtual machines. And you will need to provide your own network and the list of IP addresses. And if there are broken disks, physical disks are not sent back to the vendor. It means that we will not send the disks that contain sensitive data to Dell, for example, or to MaxTor or to uh, Seagate. If the disk is damaged, uh, to, for them to fix it, because it contains sensitive data. If the disk is damaged, it is, that's it. So we will not repair it with the vendor because it's sensitive data. Those are design choices. And this is how to access to uh, ePOTA. Apply for a CSC project. You can apply through EOSCUP. And as I just answered in the chat, for EOSCUP services, all services, they have at least a quota that can be accessed for free. So through the EOSCUP marketplace, you will see, uh, for example, for uh, ePOTA in, in, in CSC, what is the, the, the free package uh, composed of? Uh, how much uh, virtual machines, how many CPUs, how uh, the storage description, everything about the free quota, and this you can get for free through ESCOB. If your project is big and you want to do advanced research, you, you need more and more resources, this will be uh, for pay, and then you can find the uh, the, the ePOTA pricing, just if you type in Google ePOTA pricing, you will find the price page. And this is the, uh, the link where you find uh, details about how to get connected to ePOTA. So this is about the secure cloud ePOTA. And this is the sensitive data platform. It's uh, sort of a complicated because, I mean, I mean for, for, for uh, people who don't have much background about uh, uh, IT. So I, I will describe it in, in brief. This is the connection from outside. This is the CSC network. There is secure storage for, for, storage, for storing sensitive data. And there will be also possibility for having a desktop connection. And this is a new feature. In, in ePOTA, you will be able to have a remote desktop connection to a virtual machine. Next is services for sensitive data at the University of Oslo. And there is uh, a video about TSD here. I will paste in the chat. So TSD is Tjensta for sensitive data. Tjensta is services in Norwegian. And the difference between TSD and ePOTA, you just described that ePOTA is infrastructure as a service. So they give you the secure connection to a collection of resources, but you need to be able to manage these resources. You need to be able to install your stuff. In TSD, it is different. It is not infrastructure as a service. It is platform as a service and software as a service. It means that if you are a researcher or a group of researchers, 
who don't have any background about IT, about programming. You are just doing research, using some tools to analyze your data. You don't make tools, you don't install software. CSD is the right place for you because we install the software for you. We manage the resources. Uh, you ask us to install this software. We support both Windows and Linux. So you need only to uh, uh, do your research and analyze your data. This is how the TSD looks like. So this is a firewall, and you access the TSD through two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication, it means that you will have a username and password, not only those two, but you will need to have a one-time code. You will install a software called Google Authenticator on your mobile, and it will generate one time code that expires every one minute. So every TSD user has this on the smartphone, and you will access TSD through that. And through the firewall, you will be able to access the project VM. And this is remote desktop. If you are a Linux user, we will provide a, a Linux VM for you. If you are a Windows user, we will provide a Windows virtual machine for you. And those virtual machines are connected to the secure storage. Each project in TSD has its own secure storage that is totally isolated from other TSD projects. There is a shared area in TSD, and this shared area does not include sensitive data. If, for example, there is some reference genome, which is uh, something that can be used by different projects, we put it there because it is not sensitive. If there are some pieces of software that can be used by many projects, we put it there because it's not sensitive. In addition to that, we support high-performance computing. And this high-performance computing is a Slurm cluster. It's a collection of nodes that are connected through InfiniBand, which is high-speed uh, connection where you can do high performance computing. Like in, in, when, when, when you are doing genomic analysis uh, for variant calling or, uh, or even sequence alignment, if you want to do this in parallel or to, if something that is requiring uh, a lot of CPUs, a lot of memories, we have huge memory nodes for memory intensive things. And we also support, we, we, we bought uh, the machine that's called Edico Dragon. I'm not sure if anyone of you heard about this Dragon FPGA processor for uh, genomic pipelines. We have one in TSD, and this can reduce the time of, for example, variant calling pipelines from three days to 20 minutes. Uh, I got a question here. Is DSD storage uh, located in Europe? Yes, it is located in Norway. The storage is located in Norway at the University of Oslo, physically, of course. And this is a more a detailed uh, structure of TSD. So this is the user access from outside through two-factor authentication. Each project has its own isolated area. And you have a access to a collection of virtual machine. This is Colossus. This is our HPC cluster. Each project will have a storage area, which is the main storage here, the main storage, and also some smaller storage on the HPC cluster. This storage is faster than that storage, but it is more expensive. So if you are buying, for example, uh, 100 terabytes here, and you want to buy 10 terabytes there, it is double the price. So uh, one terabyte in the, in, in the uh, main storage is half the price of one terabyte in, this, in, the, in the cluster storage, because this is an expensive storage, the reason that it is very fast. So accessing the data from the compute nodes to the, fast, to, the, to the cluster storage is much faster than accessing it from the virtual machines here to the, uh, to the main storage. Uh, yes, it is 100% secure, and we, it, uh, to, to, to make sure that it is 100% secure, we uh, periodically perform some uh, sort of uh, penetration testing, which means that we get some security expert 
uh, and, and those security experts are worldwide known, uh, and we ask them to attack our systems and find vulnerabilities. What are the problems? And uh, we did this for, for EPOTA, we did this for TSD, they generate reports for us, what is, what is ideal, what needs to be considered, and we take this into consideration. And after some time, we hire other uh, security experts to try to hack the system again and to, to, to see what are the security holes. So uh, we, we are taking care of that, yes. Uh, yeah, about the, the isolation, uh, that, that's, that's a good question. Every single project has its own virtual LAN. It, it looks like, uh, I will make it more clear for it, to, to try to make it more simple. It looks like each project has its own switch, physical switch, because virtual LAN is physical separation of networks. So this storage is not seen by any of these virtual machines. And that storage is not seen by any of these virtual machines. So each project has its own virtual LAN. This part of the disk is accessible only by those virtual machines. No one can get access to it. It means that if someone, a malicious user, gets uh, hack one of these virtual machines and get root or administrator, he can do nothing. And uh, also we have root squash which means that if you are root or administrator on a virtual machine, you cannot access the project data. You have to be a valid project user to access this data. By default, every single user has import rights, can get data from outside to inside. But, uh, oh, sorry, did I? Yes. I don't know why the, uh, yes. But only project administrators has export rights. They can take data from inside to outside. But the project administrator or the project owner has the right to ask for uh, export rights to other users uh, if, if needed. But this will be the responsibility of the project administrator. Uh, we have support for new service, and this is an ongoing work. Uh, so in, in, in this page here, you see that there is an HPC resource, and this is a cluster that is shared by everyone. Of course, the data of every project that is processed in this cluster is totally isolated, but still everyone is accessing the cluster, which means that if someone is using a lot of resources right now, then you have to wait until there is these resources are available. So what we are doing here is to create a fully containerized cluster. So this will be the project VLAN inside the TSD. You will have your own cluster that is containerized, Docker-based. And you can have more or less compute nodes as you want. And we will have support for both Singularity and Docker containers as to, to, to run your own jobs. And by now, we have support on the HPC cluster for Singularity. So if you get a Singularity container, you can run the Singularity application and close it. Uh, so far, we have more than 500 projects. Now it's about 3,000 users and more than 800 virtual machines and more than two terabytes of data. And we are supporting some web forms and APIs for sending data in. So the patients can fill in some forms about, for example, for cases of psychology, if you want to record the history of one patient, the patient can fill in some web forms to collect some information, and this will be taken securely to TSD. And there is an API support where you can connect from e-health devices or smart devices to collect clinical data. So we have support for collecting clinical data instantly. And we have a consent system in TSD. I will show you the interface. This consent system, since for the GDPR is mainly about consent, so the consent system is for 
patients, I mean the, the, the data subjects, to provide consent on the data processing for the specific purpose. So when they fill in the form, they will define which data set, they will define the purpose, I provide consent for this type of processing on this type of, on this data set to this project. And from inside TSD, there will be the verification of the content. Before you as a researcher start processing or analyzing this data, you can verify did the patient give consent on that or not yet. So this is in brief the features of TSD. You have platform as a service, sim, uh, software as a service, support for both Windows and Linux, high performance computing, sensitive data web forms, data collection using smart devices, consent system, and we have anonymization of structured data. Uh, this service is, okay, I'll describe this at the end. These are the steps how to get a TSD project, and you can apply through USCUB as well in the same way that I mentioned on ePOTA. So you need to get, if you are a clinical researcher, you are doing research with clinical data, you need to get approval from REC, and this is the research uh, ethical committee, that your research is valid. Uh, and you need to submit some uh, documents about the research, and those are the two in, the most important things, data processor agreement between, between your institution and TSD, so that you give data, you, you assign TSD as a data processor, where you are the data controller. And then commercial contract between your project and TSD. If you, are, if you will go for the basic package that will provide for, for free, then you will not need to pay anything. If you want some advanced resources, then you will need to sign this contract and fill in the electronic application. And that's it. Apply for a TSP project, upload your data, start working. Here is the user guide, and if you want more about pricing, TSP pricing. Uh, some EOSCUB activities that we are currently doing is use the EU.B to share to to, to publish metadata about sensitive data. So this is how it will be. You will have B2Find, which is the search engine for, uh, for B2Share. You will, the, 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 the researchers from outside will be able to search for the metadata about your research once you publish it. And then you will request access to this metadata. And this, this request will be passed to you, and you can grant access to the to, to, to the data for this research. So in brief, you will be able to publish some metadata about your data sets on B2Share. This metadata will be findable publicly by other researchers. If someone finds it interesting, will contact you through us, and then we will, you, you will be able to grant access. Uh, this will be a bit complex, and it will not be, uh, I will not be able to, 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 to describe it here, but I think you will have the slides. This is the, the structure of how this is taking place. If you need more deep questions, you can ask me later when you get the slides. Uh, we have support currently for uDocker and TSD. So we support both Singularity and uDocker, and the advantage that of you Docker that you work with Docker containers and you don't really need to install, to, to convert the Docker container to a Singularity container like what you do in Singularity. Use the Docker container as it is and it has support for MPI parallel applications. And ePOTA is also working on it. For data anonymization, uh, we are currently having a pilot for Amnesia and uh, this is uh, a data anonymization tool for structured data. So it is not for unstructured data. If you have sort of a fast queue uh, file, you want to anonymize that, this is not the tool for you. But you have, if, if you have your data in a structured format, like Excel sheet or something, this is the tool for you. And uh, once the pilot is uh, tested, we, will plan, we are planning to have Amnesia instance on every single TSD project 
we will support this as a service. So this is the, uh, the link for the services for sensitive data in ISCAB. And there are other Nordic activities. We are planning to have connection between ePOTA and TSD so that if your TSD resources are not sufficient, you can get some resources inside ePOTA uh, to use within your TSD network. And we have TRIGVA, which is a Nordic project that includes both TSD and ePOTA and also a site in Denmark that is Computer ROM and a site in Sweden that is Mosler all for sensitive data. So if you have a project that you have some data in Denmark and you have some data in Norway and you need to do distributed processing for this data, you can contact Trigva. This is this project, what is it about? So just Google Nike Trigva and you'll find the website and all of the information. And those are the contacts. Maria Francesca is the leader and I'm the co-leader. Antiporsola is from CSC and in addition to Chris. Yes, that's it. So please uh, ask questions. I'm trying to get where the chat. Yes, thanks a lot. Well, let me also yeah. try to locate the chat. Can you see chat now? Yes, I can see it. Yes. So, um, so maybe let, let's start from uh, I don't know from the beginning or from the end. <laughs> I I think I answered the, the question about the, the security, right? Uh, what kind of guarantees are provided uh, for security? I answered that. Um, well, there was a comment from CIS that, uh, that sounded more like hacker-proof. Again? CIS uh, uh, wrote back that that sounded more like hacker-proof when you were describing security, but I don't know whether it was just a comment or a question. Yeah, so, so uh, what, what I described is that to, to, to ensure security, we are doing penetration testing. And yes, and, and, and this is sort of trying to hack our system in order to see where the security holes are. And we do this uh, periodically. We, we hire some expert to, uh, to, uh, to try to, to hack the system and see what. To. So the, the, the penetration testing is, is divided into two parts. Part number one, if you are not a user of TSD, can you log into TSD or not? Part number two, if you are a TSD user of project X, can you access the data of project Y or not? So th those are the, the, the tests that we are uh, normally uh, doing. And, uh, and we performed this uh, penetration testing and the results was okay. And uh, mainly we have a firewall uh, for TSD and we have a virtual LAN uh, separation between uh, TSD projects. So um, I hope that this answers that question. And uh, how long will the data be stored in TSD? And what is the prediction about the lifespan of TSD itself? I will start answering the, the last question. The, T TSD has been a, a, as a project infrastructure. Now it is a service. So there is no end time for TSD now because it's service that permanently supported by the University of Oslo. How long the data be stored at TSD? It depends on how long your research will take. So you, when, 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 when you sign the agreement with, with TSD, you define the start time of the project and the end time of the project. After the end time of the project, the data can be archived in TSD and we can keep this for some time, but you need to define ways to export your data and you will be responsible for your data after you end your research. We will not keep it for you forever after you, you finish the, the, the analyzing, otherwise we will not have enough storage for everyone. So 
uh, you define uh, how long your project will take, and of course you can extend this if it takes longer. How do you address the access of admins who have root access to the system? Can they have potential access to sensitive data? Uh, this is a very good question because we have, uh, let's say, different layers of, uh, of administrations. Not every administrator in TSD can do everything. We have, for example, the, the normal TSD administrators and then we have another group that is TSD core, and those are the ones who can do anything. And we have to have this group of people because we need to be able to solve the problems. But we have very strict rules that whenever we need, in order to, uh, to troubleshoot something, whenever we need access to sensitive data, we have to ask the project administrator in order to solve this problem, I need to access this disk. Can I do this or not? And uh, every administrator is obliged to ask before taking any action. Uh, you have any organized security standard you follow? I need evidence and, and arguments. There is uh, a person that owns that this service would be safe. We have uh, a risk analysis uh, document. So there is a TSD white paper. And you can uh, send us uh, an email to get the white paper. And we have also a document about the, uh, the TSD uh, risk analysis. And we can give you that. The security standard. Uh, uh, I, I will not be able to describe everything right now, but you can ask me specific questions about what 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 you are interested uh, in, and I can give you the answers. But yes, we have security uh, uh, rules for the data storage, for the data processing, for the access, uh, for the, the 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 user separation. Uh, so, so it, it, it depends on what, what, what you are asking about, but we can provide you the, the details. Um, uh, your users are social scientists or not? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, then TSD is, is, is for you. Uh, we are not dealing with users that they are professionals, no. Uh, some of our users are, are, are very competent in IT and they can do things and actually they are helping us sometimes to, uh, to verify things and to test some, some new features. But most of our users are this type. We expect our users to be researchers, not to be IT specialists. Um, yes. Uh, we are using Singularity. Is it before because of security concerns over Docker? Uh, well, this is part of the answer, yes. Because Singularity, by default, uh, it runs containers as the user. And Docker, by default, runs containers as the root. But there is a solution that we provide right now in TSD for you to run Docker containers, but not on the main cluster. Uh, the, the concern here is not about security, but, but that the, uh, our cluster has an older kernel. It is sent to S6, and it is not ideal for Docker. We will have a new version of the cluster by the beginning of the year uh, with uh, uh, a newer kernel, I mean, a, a newer operating system. And by then, we will be able to run Docker on the main cluster. So do we support singularity? Yes. Do we support Docker? Yes. Our support for Singularity is currently wider than our support for Docker, but this is going to change soon, so we have both a degree of support for both platforms. And of course, we don't use Docker as it is, but we are sandboxing uh, Docker container run so that it is, uh, it is secure. Uh, do you use specific software? to create the secure environment per project 
on the HPC cluster. Uh, the, 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 I'm not sure what the secure environment here means, but uh, and the, our, our cluster is uh, Slurm, and this storage on that uh, on, on the HPC cluster is uh, separated by Linux permissions. So each project, I mean, each project who is using HPC, not every project needs HPC. Some people need TSD only for storage. So for those who need to use HPC, they will have a temporary storage on the HPC cluster. They can store sensitive data there, and access to this storage is allowed only by this group, which is the group who is a member of Project X. And no one has data access to that directory other than this group. Um, Security-wise, Singularity is also quite full of flaws. Yes, I, we, we know that, so we, uh, uh, but not right now, to be honest. Since 2.6, the, the versions before 2.6, we were getting almost every two weeks a, uh, an alarm that uh, delete all of the ver previous versions of Singularity and install this new version because we for the security hole. And then after one month, another email, we discovered another security thread, just delete all of the previous versions and install the new version. <laughs> now it's, it's, it's quite better, but yeah. yeah. So uh, now it is better in addition to the fact that even if you get root on the Singularity container, we have root squash. Root squash is a, is, a, is, a, is a level of security that, you, you, I mean, you cannot, you, cannot, um, uh, you cannot prevent malicious access, but it, it, it stops you from making mistakes. So if you are root, you can impersonate anyone. But if you run something as root, you will not be able to access the, the user data because you need to be a user. So... Uh, what we support with Singularity, we try to test all of the Singularity, uh, the Singularity version against the uh, uh, security risks. And if you get, if, if, if you use the Singularity, you will not be able to use the shell. You will not get interactive uh, shell with the Singularity container. It means that if there is a problem that you can get root, you will not be able to access the data because you need to have the shell. Yeah, but uh, all all these problems you have. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> all these problems you have because uh, Singularity is a tool for the system administrators. Yeah, if uh, so, in the end, what it does is expose uh, features to regular users um, that belong to to the root user, and then it yeah. tries to cut it down to cut so that the the, the user does not escape from there. No. And this is very difficult. This is uh, that, that is bound to exactly. trouble, no? As we know. So I, uh, therefore, I was uh, pointing out here yeah. uh, another yes. service. Yes, exactly. So th this is a philosophy problem of singularity. That uh, normally they use CPU uh, ID binary, and this is very, very dangerous. Yeah. It means that it really depends on the, the skill of the, of the developer. Not to have, not to allow any security threats. And so, so if there is a security hole, then the, the, the software will, will be unsecure. Uh, on the other hand, you, Docker, you Docker, is using a different philosophy. Don't use, don't use any UID binary, and don't require any little privileges to install it. So we really recommend you Docker over. And the problem, but the problem is that the features, the features of Docker are not uh, 
as many as they want in singularity, including the support of MPI. There is a support of MPI. There is an echo in the sound. Others can mute themselves. Uh, you Docker is, is, more, is, is more secure than Singularity, and it is user space. So, uh, it is, so uh, it is recommended for secure Singularity, but we will still support Singularity and be careful about that because our user is really, really. Okay. So, if there is no more questions. The question from okay. Christina. Is email for Tina to comply with the right to email stuff? To comply with the right stuff? Oh, yeah, of course. If, if we will oh, yeah. enable you, Docker, we will, enable you. Things, yeah. we will not uh, have the singularity in the world. No, no, Is it better now with an echo? I guess it is. Uh, just wanted to say that there was also a question from Christina. TSD may also support to comply with the rights of the data subjects. Did you provide a system for withdrawal consent? Uh, is, is this question about the consent system? Yes. Did we answer that already? So the answer is yes. We provide a system for yeah. We have we, we have this system to provide consent about processing of specific data sets. So if 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 you get some some clinical data, you definitely need the consent for analyzing this data. And this uh, web form that is connected to TSD allows the data subject to submit the consent. And yes, with the role of the consent, because in the GDPR, it is essential part the right to be forgotten. And then there was another question from uh, Narkes. Uh, in other words, how do you create the sandbox? Uh, how, which sandbox is it referring to? Narkes is writing. Yeah, I, I, I just need a clarification about what, what is sandbox here. He's referring to the secure environment on the HPC cluster as sandbox. Yeah. So, are you referring to the to the to the solution of one HPC cluster for all, or for the solution where each one will have own HPC cluster? Each one. Of okay. So. Uh, If you are referring to the to the second solution, that is one HPC cluster per project, uh, each project will have a collection of virtual machines, and those virtual machines you can install Slurm as a queuing system or HT Condor as a queuing system. You 
can install Docker Swarm also if you are familiar with Docker, and you will use those virtual machines as compute nodes. So virtual machines can be used in the TSD system in, 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 in three categories. Either only as login virtual machines, and those will be very small virtual machines with like two CPUs, and because you use only as login and to access your data, or you can use the virtual machine to run some services. Like, for example, if you like to have uh, Open Clinica, if you want to have our studio, if you want to have Shiny Server, so this you, you will get a virtual machine for that. And also, you can get a compute virtual machine, like a big virtual machine, like 32 cores or 64 cores. And you can, you can have a collection of those to have your own HPC cluster within your own project. This will be a, a, a better solution for you because no one will, you will not have a contention with every with, with everyone on the same HPC cluster. You will not need to wait in the queue to submit your jobs, uh, to, to, for your jobs to be allocated on the resources. Uh, and this will be within the virtual LAN of your project. So those virtual machines are project virtual machines. No one else will get access to these virtual machines other than uh, your project members. Okay. Uh, Narkes is also asking how about the secure environment on the HPC cluster Colossus? For, uh, for Colossus, uh, the jobs of a specific uh, project will be isolated from the jobs of all other projects. For example, when you uh, list the, the, the jobs on the queue, your jobs will be listed by your name and the other jobs will be listed by nobody. And you will not be able to see the names of the jobs. You will not be able to access the files of the jobs. So for uh, for the for, for there are some certain configurations on on the queuing system that we do for for this purpose and now the new policy will be that every project will have its own compute nodes so when when you want to use the hpc cluster you will book this compute node or this collection of compute nodes for the project this will be more isolation these compute nodes are yours when your jobs are running and it will access only your data. Other compute nodes will be used by other people. So there will be no jobs running on the same compute nodes from different projects. Thank you. And there was an earlier question from Garrett. So I'm trying to scroll up to find it. And I guess it was also maybe to Isabel. So just a minute. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to read it now, but sorry. The suite of UX services is very exciting. However, however, there is a perception that it's designed to accommodate big open science projects. I'd like to get an idea of how it would scale for small size, size projects. For example, would it be possible to de deploy an access and preservation suite for a community archive project, uh, for example, with Atom, uh, with uh, Ar Ar Archivmatica, that could utilize EOSC Docker containers as storage? EOSC Docker container as Storage, are you referring to using containers as storage elements? I guess yes. Oh, Garrett is typing, so let, let's see, maybe he'll go. Yes. Okay. Um, well, our, our use of containers and uh, and even, even, even Docker's policy is not to use containers to store data. You can use containers for uh, for uh, tool portability, but not for data portability. So our always, always our recommendation for the users, make one tool per container or more, but don't store data inside the container. We don't like to see a container with 100 gigabytes because 
containers are not really designed for that. Uh, you can have volumes within Docker, for example, but not to store the data inside the container unless it is very, very necessary. If you are going to store data inside the container, then you can use virtual machines. Then you can have a, a bunch of tools and a lot of data in, a one, in one virtual machine. So containers are not replacing virtual machines. Virtual machine, machines are good for some things, and containers are good for other things. If you want to have a huge object of a lot of tools and a lot of data, then it's better to have a virtual machine. If you want to have a nice and small and lightweight virtualization for some, for, for some tools, and you want this to be portable, then you use, you use containers. If we open up for having huge containers, then we might get into some resource uh, problems that we don't want to, to get into the complexity of solving that. So I don't say that it is not allowed to have big containers, but there are some limitations for this. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rahman. That was very lively discussion, and thank you all for your questions. Uh, so once again, thank you, Abdul Rahman, uh, Isabel, Ali, and Ellen, uh, who organized this webinar. And I would like to echo Ellen's request. Uh, if you feel a need for more webinars like that, please uh, drop topics uh, in the chat, uh, and we'll uh, organize more. Uh, joint webinars uh, with US Cub and Open Air. Uh, I will send you slides and recording, uh, and uh, I wish you a good rest of the day. And thanks again to our excellent speakers and to all of you for questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye.